Good morning. You're watching the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church. We are located in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We welcome you to join us in the worship of God and the study of His Word on this Lord's Day, May 16th, 2021. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the marvelous things that you have done. We thank you that in Jesus you have made known your salvation and revealed your righteousness. Help us as we worship, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our first hymn is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Our first Bible reading for this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, and I will be reading Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, 
the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Our next two songs are Majesty and Lift Up Your Heads. Our second reading for this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, and I will be reading chapter 29, verses 1 through 12. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it, for out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, it is well, and see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together, and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. 
While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Our contemporary song is King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle.
Good morning, children. It is now your part of the service. Get ready for a song and a story. Thank you, Sylvia and Malcolm. Good morning, children. We have been learning some of the names of God for 30 weeks. Can you believe it? I would love for you to send me an email or a letter listing all of the names that you can think of. Maybe your parents could mail it to me or send it to the mailbox on the church's website. We just sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. How do we know that Jesus loves us? Yes, the Bible tells us he does in many verses. In Psalm 36, verse 7, it says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never changes. Steadfast means that we can count on his love for our whole lives. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. That is in John 15, verse 9. Jesus says that just as God loved him, he loves us the same way and just as much. Of course, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. When you love someone, you want to talk to them all of the time. Jesus talks to us through the Bible. That is why we need to read it. When he answers our prayers, it reminds us that he really cares for us. The rest of the song goes, Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus promises to take care of us and help us even if we are little. Yes, Jesus does love us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you love each and every one of us, from the tiniest baby to the oldest person. Thank you that we can read the Bible and hear you talk to us. Please help the children to love you back. Bless these little ones, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Malcolm and Sylvie. And thank you, Andrew. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for forgiveness of sins and for salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you can take even the mess that we've made of our lives and redeem them for your glory. Thank you for the message of the gospel, the message that we are entrusted with. Thank you for the privilege we have of sharing the good news that Jesus is Lord, even in the world that we live in, and that we will one day enter his glory. We pray this morning for our Baptist brethren across this country, for those who, like us, proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. We ask that you would bless them and help them to be true to that message. 
We pray for all those, whatever their denomination, who proclaim the truth in Jesus' name. We ask that you'd strengthen the Church in our day. We pray particularly that you would strengthen our Church. We ask that you would strengthen those of us who are already ministering here in Jesus' name, that we would stand for truth and righteousness. But we ask that you would bring others to minister alongside us in this ministry. We ask that you would strengthen us physically as well. You know those among us who are sick or weak or in chronic pain. You know those who need surgery or other help. We ask you to raise each one back to health and that you would encourage them as they minister to those around them in Jesus' name. We pray for those who are ministering on the front lines in these days of pandemic. We ask that you would bless them and protect them and their families. And we ask that this pandemic would soon be over, that we might be able again to meet face to face as we worship. But as we meet virtually again this morning, we ask your blessing on us. Teach us and lead us, we pray, by your Spirit, through your Word. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God had told Rebecca, before the twins were born, that Jacob was chosen. He deserved the blessing. His older brother had despised his right to it. His father should have given it to him, but he planned to give it to Esau, his favorite son. In Genesis 27, Jacob had tricked his father into giving him the blessing. He and his mother had schemed to have Jacob pretend to be Esau, since his father could no longer see properly. Esau felt cheated and was thinking murderous thoughts about his twin brother. So Rebekah persuaded her husband to send Jacob away, to find a wife among her people. Isaac had again blessed Jacob and sent him on his way. One night during his journey, Jacob dreamed about a stairway to heaven. Last week we read about that dream in which God confirmed the promises he had made first to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. That was Genesis 28. Let's continue with Genesis 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it, for out of that well the flocks were watered. In Mesopotamia, in an area called Paddan Aram, was the town of Haran. That was the town Jacob was looking for in order to find his mother's family. As Jacob neared Haran, he came across a well where there were no less than three separate flocks of sheep waiting to be watered. And if there are three flocks of sheep, there are at least three shepherds with them. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. When Diane and I lived near the village of Baltimore, there was a dug well on the property. It was covered with a concrete slab. When we were having difficulties with the water pump in the house, I had to lift off the concrete slab and climb into the well to check on that end. The stone covering the mouth of this well was much heavier. It seems it took more than one shepherd to uncover the well. I'm imagining in my mind at least three shepherds, perhaps teenagers. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. Jacob was on his way to Haran, but he wouldn't know how far away it was. So he accosted these shepherds, I think he may have called them brothers, to emphasize the fact that he wasn't really a stranger. He was no threat to them. When he learned they were from Haran, he asked about Laban. He said to them, 
Is it well with him? They said, It is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. As it happened, not only did they know Laban, but Laban's daughter Rachel was approaching the well with her sheep. This would be the fourth flock at the well. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go, pasture them. In Jacob's comments to them, it sounds like he was giving these shepherds some advice. But it also sounds like he was telling them what to do and not just making a suggestion. He was giving them the benefit of his wisdom. For that reason, it seems to me, they were younger than Jacob, probably much younger. Jacob's point was that they should have taken the sheep out already to pasture. They shouldn't be waiting for each other. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban his mother's brother. Jacob wouldn't know yet if Laban had other daughters, but he had come to find a daughter of Laban to marry, and Rachel was Laban's daughter. Jacob would naturally want to be helpful to anyone from his mother's family, but I wonder if he was being a bit chivalrous toward Rachel. It's even possible that he fell for her at that moment. In any case, he didn't wait until the other shepherds rolled away the stone. He did it himself. If he alone could roll away a stone that normally required the efforts of several shepherds, then either he was exceptionally strong or, as I've already suggested, they were not yet mature men. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. This was not a romantic kiss. This would be similar to a hug between family members in our day. I suspect that Jacob's tears were tears of joy. He had traveled a long way and had found Laban's family. Not only that, he had actually met Laban's daughter. We aren't told her age, but he would know that she was single. A married woman would have been with her husband rather than caring for her father's sheep. In Genesis 24, we read about how Abraham's servant had found Jacob's mother, Rebekah, at a well, perhaps the same well, and then taken her back to Isaac to be his wife. It wouldn't surprise me if Jacob thought about that when he encountered Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel, at the well. He may have thought that this was a sign, not just that God had successfully guided him to Laban, but that God wanted him to marry Rachel. But was it? As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. I'm sure that all these things included an update on Rebekah. Laban would want to know that his sister was keeping well. And perhaps Jacob even told Laban why he was there. Laban spoke of him as his bone and flesh. I take that to mean that he accepted Jacob as a blood relative. I'm sure that this month was a significant month. During that time, Jacob would get to know Laban. He would learn if Laban and he could get along. It would also give him time to get acquainted with both of Laban's daughters. Then Laban said to Jacob, Behold, you're my kinsman. Should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Apparently, Jacob had been serving Laban, or at least helping him out. From Laban's point of view, he should be getting paid. We aren't told what kind of wages Laban had in mind. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Leah's eyes are a bit of a mystery. We aren't told in what way her eyes were weak. She may have had poor eyesight. 
but Rachel had the advantage in looks over her older sister. Next week, Lord willing, we will look at the character of each of these women. We will be looking to see which one possessed inner beauty, which one was more spiritual. So far, we know two things. We know that God planned that his Messiah would descend from Jacob, which means that Jacob's wife, one of these women, would be the ancestor of Jesus. And we know that Rachel was the attractive one. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It's better that I should give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. It had only been a month since Jacob arrived. He had seen Rachel first at the well, and he may have taken that as a sign, remembering that Abraham's servant had seen his mother, Rebekah, first at a well. Of course, there was a difference. We were told that Abraham's servant had prayed for God's guidance. Nothing is said about Jacob seeking God's guidance. We know that Jacob had seen Rachel first and that he found her attractive. And we would probably say that Jacob fell in love with her. We don't know how Laban had originally planned to pay Jacob, but Jacob offered to work for Rachel. And that suited Laban. As a man with two daughters, he was probably on the lookout for eligible suitors, and he would assume Jacob to be a good man because he was family. Besides, seven years would give him lots of time to see if Jacob was worthy to be his son-in-law. And so it was settled. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him to be but a few days because of the love he had for her. Since Jacob was working for Rachel's father, he would see her frequently, probably, and possibly even converse with her at times. We're not told. What we do know is that his love for her was undiminished over the period of seven years. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. Finally, the seven years were up. It was time for Jacob to collect his wages. It was time for him to marry Rachel. Laban put on a big celebration. At the end of the first day, the couple would be united, but the celebration would continue for a week. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why have you then deceived me? We aren't given the details, but if Leah had been veiled and if it were dark, we can understand how Jacob could have been tricked. Laban had tricked Jacob, just as Jacob had tricked his father. Then Isaac couldn't see. Now Jacob couldn't see. Jacob had tricked his father by pretending he was Esau. Laban tricked Jacob by pretending Leah was Rachel. Jacob was indignant. Imagine his surprise and his disappointment. He had worked for Rachel, not Leah. He wanted an explanation of the deception. Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Laban's justification for his action was this custom. But let's think what this means about Leah. This means that during that seven-year period, Laban had not been able to find a husband for Leah. No one had come along who thought that marrying into Laban's family was worth taking on his older daughter as wife. No one had come along who saw her, her potential as a wife and mother, despite her lack of outward beauty. That seven years must have been a long time for her. But Laban had found a way to marry off his unwanted daughter. Leah was now Jacob's wife. Annulling the marriage was not an option. But Laban had a suggestion. If he really wanted to marry Rachel, at the end of the week-long wedding feast, celebrating his marriage to Leah, he could marry Rachel. In other words, one week after marrying Leah, he could marry Rachel. And then he would be bound to serve Laban for a second seven-year period. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. 
Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. We rightly shake our heads at the thought of plural marriage. This was not part of God's plan from the beginning. In the beginning, God gave Eve to Adam to be his wife. One man, one woman. Once when Jesus was pressed about the fact that Moses had permitted divorce, he said it was because of their hardness of heart. Similarly, I think that in ancient days, God overlooked the sin of plural marriages. However, Jesus made it clear, as did Paul, that marriage was for one man, one woman. And there are always consequences if we don't follow God's plan. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Next week, I plan to begin at this verse and talk about Jacob's children. However, this morning, we need to take a few minutes for a word study that will affect our understanding of other scriptures. We need to look at a special use of the words hate or hated and of the words love or loved. Most times in scripture, the words hate and love are used in much the same way as we would use them today. They mean literally love and hate. But there are about a half a dozen times in Scripture when they're used in what we might think of as an exaggerated way, a way that we have to be careful to understand. This verse says that Leah was hated, so God opened her womb. Now we know, for two reasons, that this must be an expression. First, Jacob must have had some love relationship with her, or she would not have had children. Second, in the previous verse, it clearly says that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. So hated is not meant literally in this verse. Rather, it is an expressive way, a strong way of saying loved less. With that in mind, let's look at other instances. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think most of us would agree that we as Christians are not supposed to hate our father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. In fact, we know that the opposite is true. We are supposed to love them. Yet here we have a verse in which Jesus clearly tells believers to hate their families, if we take it literally. But we don't take this literally, and we agree that Jesus didn't mean that we were to hate our own lives. This saying makes sense as an expression. Hate is used here to mean that we are to love Jesus more than we love our families and even ourselves. In Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Here we see the same pattern. A man with two masters will prefer one to the other. He will give his best service to the one rather than the other. In John 12, 25, Jesus said, Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, the word hates is not meant literally. Jesus was not counseling suicide. He used hates as an expression meaning loves less. He was telling them that if they put their life here on earth first, they would lose it. But whoever put their earthly life second, which would mean putting Jesus and their spiritual life first, that person would experience eternal life. In Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country, and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. God was not speaking literally through Malachi. God was reminding his people that he had preferred Jacob, their ancestor. He had chosen Jacob, not Esau, making him the father of the Israelites and giving them Canaan as their homeland. The proof of God's hatred for Esau was that their homeland was laid waste. 
In Romans 9.13, Paul quoted this verse from Malachi, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. He didn't pull this verse out of context to mean that God had saved Jacob and condemned Esau. Rather, he used this verse to remind the Roman believers that God had chosen Jacob rather than Esau the firstborn to be the ancestor of God's people Israel. And that in Paul's day, God had chosen to spread the gospel among the Gentiles because the Jews, as God's firstborn, had rejected Jesus. In each of these verses, in Genesis, Malachi, Luke, John, and Romans, the words hated and loved were not used literally, but rather to express preference or priority. Let's close by returning to Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Let's compare these events to what happened when Jacob was blessed by his father. Jacob had tricked Isaac against his wishes, and Isaac had blessed Jacob. And that result stood. Jacob had received the blessing. We know that God's plan was for Jacob to receive the blessing, the inheritance of land and offspring as promised to Abraham. Jacob had tricked Isaac into doing what God wanted to happen. Laban had tricked Jacob against his wishes, and Jacob had married Leah, and that result stood. Leah became Jacob's wife. Is it possible that it was God's plan for Leah to be Jacob's wife? Is it possible that Laban had tricked Jacob into doing what God wanted to happen? More than possible, it's true. First, notice that God had kept Leah from getting married. During those seven years, Laban would have turned away suitors for his younger daughter, Rachel, by telling them that she was already spoken for. During that time, we would have expected that even the unattractive Leah would have eventually had a suitor. But it didn't happen. In seven long years, though her father had wanted her married first, God had kept her single. God had kept her for Jacob. Second, I will jump ahead in time and tell you that Jesus was descended from Leah. That should be proof enough that she was God's choice for Jacob. Next week, I believe we will see in part why God wanted Leah to be Jacob's wife. When I was younger, I understood these events from Jacob's point of view. I could understand him falling in love with a beautiful woman. Of course he wanted to marry Rachel. I felt sorry for Leah, to be sure. But my thinking was as shallow as Jacob's. I felt sorry for him being cheated, even though he had done the same to his father. I took his side and Rachel's side in this story. I even excused him for marrying a second wife. After all, he loved her so much, he worked 14 years for her. I was seeing these events simply as a love story. I've enjoyed a good romance since reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice for the first time in my late teens. And I'm privileged to be married to the woman I fell in love with. But in stories, romantic love is the most important virtue and value. It's more important than other commitments, more important than previous vows, and even more important than God's laws. In Christian reality, we are to put obedience to God first, our vows and commitments second, and wisdom third. There's nothing wrong with falling in love or being in love when we can do so in obedience to God and without breaking our marriage vows. Romance should never be put ahead of righteousness. It didn't occur to me when I was younger that God wanted Jacob to marry Leah, that Rachel was Jacob's choice, not God's, just as Esau had been Isaac's choice and not God's. And God had overruled in both situations. Jacob could have and should have accepted that his choice was wrong and that God's choice was Leah. He should have allowed Rachel to become the wife of someone else. That would have been the right thing to do. Instead, following his feelings, he married Rachel too. We will see next week that Jacob had created a real mess for himself. But God would take Jacob's sin and the mess he had made, and use that for his purposes as well. Let us pray. 
Father, help us as we bring our whole lives into submission to your will. Bless us, we pray, in our obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is Face to Face. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>